let me see if I've got this straight. God is big, like really big, but he's also in the small things. We can't see him, and yet he's incredibly close. His character never changes, but at the same time, we can't predict what he's going to do. He's got control over everything, but we can still make our own choices. He is all powerful and good, but evil still exists in the world. He's a God of justice, yet he loves everyone and forgives anyone who asks. And all of that is supposed to make sense? And all of that's supposed to make sense? That's a great question. As a matter of fact, to let you know that for the over 50 years that I've been following Christ, I'll tell you that there's a lot about God that I understand and I get. But there's a whole lot more about him, who he is and how he is, that I'm still scratching my head over. I don't understand. And here's the thing. For those of you that may be in the same boat, it's okay. We're dealing with a God who is infinite. I can't even wrap my mind around that concept of infinity. But God is infinite. And all of his attributes, he's infinite and all of that as well too. So it's completely appropriate that there would be a lot about God that we don't fully comprehend. But that's part of the journey of being able to explore the nature of who he is. And so I'm extremely excited to see you here. For those of you that may be watching online, thanks from wherever you are. Hope you're safe and that you're comfortable there. As well as for those who are watching from the campuses, whether you're here at South Park or at Fort Mill, Ballantyne, South Boulevard, um, or at our Eastland campus. And I just wanted to say hello to Eastland because this is their second week meeting as the campus. For all of our campuses, we're glad that you are here. I'm excited to see you as we begin this brand new series on the nature of God. And here's the question that starts it all. What's the most important thing about you? What's the most important thing about you? Now, we might say it's, it's kind of what I bring to the table or what I know or who I am or my contacts. But A.W. Tozer is one of my favorite authors and who was actually touted to be one of the greatest, most inspirational Christian evangelists, authors, and pastors of the 20th century. Here's what he said, that what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. He goes on to say that no person or church ever rises above its religion and no religion rises above its concept, its idea of God. That no matter what we say, no matter what we do, what we proclaim, what we say we believe in, that what we actually conceive God to be like in our heart that that actually formats how we see him, how we see the world, how we see ourselves, how we see other people. And therefore, that understanding that that concept of who we think God is actually begins to affect the quality of our life now, and it can also predict our future life and our future destiny spiritually with God, which makes a series like this extremely important because here's one of the things I, I think maybe you can relate to. I don't like to be misinterpreted. Right? I don't like when people think something true about me that's not really true about me, something that I reveal that's completely contrary because it's impossible to have a relationship of intimacy with someone who sees you differently than you are. Can I say this? Same thing with God. You can't have an intimate relationship with the infinite God if our concept of him is incorrect. And so I want to kind of present to you a kind of guiding passage of Scripture for this series we'll be doing over the next several weeks on this God who doesn't make sense, but he's still available. And we find this passage of Scripture in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 9. I'm going to ask you if you would please, as we do, with the honor of the reading of God's Word, but the authority and the power in it, that you'd stand to your feet if you're able. And let's take a look at this passage as a filter for what we're doing throughout this series. Jeremiah chapter 9, beginning with verse 23. This is what the Lord says. The wise person should not boast in his wisdom. The strong should not boast in his strength. The wealthy should not boast in his wealth. But the one who does boast should boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord showing faithful love and justice and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things. This is the Lord's declaration, not Jeremiah's declaration, not Jonathan's declaration. It is the Lord's declaration, and it is the word 
of the Lord. You may be seated. I know our tendency is sometimes to brag about what we've got or to brag about how much we know or brag about our strength and our abilities. This passage basically says that the greatest pursuit, the greatest priority of our life is to knowing and understanding God. And quite frankly, we're dependent on his self-disclosure. In other words, we can't know anything about God. Like in relationships, you can't really know something about somebody unless they divulge information. We can't know anything about God unless he's revealed himself. And quite frankly, God has made some amazing self-disclosures of who he is. We see that especially through scripture. God has revealed himself, everything that we need to know, not everything that we can know about God, scripture contains. And scripture reminds us that even when people say that they know something, if it contradicts what's in scripture, then I would say you probably need to revisit that or even chuck it because what's in scripture agreeing with who God is, we've got to stand in harmony with that. And scripture tells us that God has also revealed himself in nature. That if you take a humble look at creation, it reveals aspects of the nature of God. The scripture also reveals that God has revealed himself perfectly, sufficiently, magnificently through his son, Jesus Christ. God in the flesh. You want to know about who God is? You look at Jesus. And then also, Jesus says that the spirit of God guides us into all truth and leads us into a proper understanding of who God is. And so we take a look at that with the scriptures, with creation, with the spirit, the son of God. Here's what this tells us. This is a God who desires to be known. He wants to be known and has made it possible for us to do that. And he also delights in being known as well. My wife, I may, and I, we knew each other as friends before we got married, but around the time that I decided to start dating her, one of the things I asked her, because her name is spelled A-I-M-E-E, -E, but I've always known her as Amy, but I know she comes from the Dominican Republic, so I said to her, I may, I said, Amy, how should I pronounce your name according to your tongue? She says, it's okay, just call me Amy. I'm like, no, no, I, I want to know how to say your name properly, and she said, well, it's I may, and I said, well, from now on, I want to call you by your name, I may. And I said, well, why have you been telling people it's Amy? And she says, because quite frankly, it's just confusing. When I, when I tell people and they're looking at the spelling, they get confused. They call me either Amy or I me or Fred. So I just said, hey, just, just call me I'm Amy. And I said, well, no, from now on, I want to call you by that name, pronounced correctly. And then I asked her later on, I said, how did it make you feel when I told you I wanted to pronounce your name according to your language? And number one, I scored some points. But number two, she said, it drew some affection in her knowing that I wanted to refer to her in a way that not a whole lot of other people would, but what's natural. It warmed her heart. How do you think God might feel when we have a sincere desire to know him? Folks, it, it brings delight to his heart. Even if we make the attempts to get to know God, and sometimes those attempts are not correct. We don't get it quite right. Some of the best theologians in our world are children, kids. And I love reading letters that, that kids write to God according to their understanding of who he is. Take a listen to some of these letters. Dear God, please put another holiday between Christmas and Easter. There's nothing good in there right now. That's from Jenny. Dear God, are you a ninja? Is that why I can't see you? Jacob. Another one, dear God, would you make me a little brother? I want somebody to boss around. Amen. Dear God, if you let the dinosaur not get extinct, we, would ha we wouldn't have a country. You made the right decision. Jonathan, dear God, did you mean for the giraffe to look like that or was that an accident? <laughs> dear God, if you give me a genie lamp like Aladdin, I will give you anything you want except my money and my chest set. Raphael. Dear God, we read Thomas Edison made light, but in Sunday school, they said that you did it. I bet he stole your idea. <laughs> Donna. Dear God, there isn't school in heaven, is there? Jack. Dear God, I think about you sometimes even when I'm not praying. It's from Elliot. And then finally, dear God, my mommy told me what you do. Who does it when you're on vacation? <laughs> Adorable, right? They're, they're cute. Unfortunately, when you become an adult, if you, if you still think the same way, it goes from being cute to acute, not very adorable, because to live as an adult with the continued wrong perception about God, and here's the thing, folks, here's the truth, here's what we've learned throughout human history, that to have a distorted view of God actually breeds destruction in our relationship with God, our relationship with other people, and our impact on the world. To have a distorted, incorrect, insufficient 
view of God can actually produce destructive results in our world. And so that's one of the reasons why this series is so necessary. When we take a look back at 2020, and we look at how we responded to some of the crises that our world went through, we took a look at how we responded to the coronavirus, especially the guidelines for safety, how people responded to that. When we took a look at how we responded to the racial crisis that erupted in our country, the cries for social justice, we take a look at all the people that were speaking. We took a look at how we responded to a very bitter and divisive election season. And folks, especially in light of what took place this past week at Capitol Hill, like many of you, I was also shocked, embarrassed, grieved by how a few people took matters into their own hands and gave the nation a bad witness to its own citizens and to the world as well. But rather than you and I only looking at what happened, we need to identify why it happened and why all of the other crazy, disorderly things in human history takes place. And it all flows from an inadequate, incorrect view of who God is and how God is. As a matter of fact, so much so that even with the church over this last year, the church of Jesus Christ, and some of the things that the church has done or said, people who proclaim to know who God is, there are places where the church didn't even give God a place at the table to say anything. People speaking for God, but in ways that didn't represent his character and his nature. Listen to me. We're going to have to, at some particular point, every one of us take responsibility for the ways that we kind of portrayed God in our reactions to people or crises or issues in ways that did not necessarily reflect who he is. But here's a challenge that for 2021, one year ago, we didn't know what was going to happen. But this year, I still don't know what's going to happen, but we can decide that right now we begin a process of learning about who God is so that no matter what may come, we live our life on the basis of what is true, that we move away from simply just a self-determined perception of God and rather we subscribe to the self-disclosure of God's revelation so that we no longer live by what we feel about God, but by what is real about him. The world desperately needs a people who live their life in a response to who God is. So the challenge is, rather than spending an awful lot of time focusing horizontally, looking at or around, that we raise our vision and look up to the God who is beyond and over and with and for us. So we're going to take a look at, over these next several weeks, at attributes of God. We want to be able to get to know who he is. And we're looking at attributes. Attributes is anything that God reveals about himself that's true about himself. Not perception, not interpretation, but what God has revealed about himself that's true about himself. And today we're going to take a look at two of God's attributes. We'll start off with his transcendence and his imminence. Now, by the way, these are big words. These are kind of doctrinal theological words, but you kind of need those kinds of words to deal with a God who as, is as magnificent as he is. So transcendence is a word that describes a God who exists and acts above and beyond any human limitations of time, matter, space, or thought. Let that sink in. That the God of the universe, this transcendent God, exists and acts beyond any limitations of space, matter, time, or even thought. Kind of reminds me of what Isaiah said in, in chapter 55 where he says, God says, my ways, my thoughts are as high above you as the heavens are above the earth. We're not going to be able to get our minds around that. Number two attribute, his imminence. Another big word, imminence. And that word describes a God, this transcendent God, who is also fully present within all his creation and yet distinct from it. A God who is fully present within all his creation and yet distinct from it. Transcendence, all the God is, and imminent that he is present with us. We're going to take a look, first of all, at the transcendence of God. 
uh, looking at a passage in Isaiah chapter 40. Here's a context of what's taking place. Isaiah is prophesying in the 8th century BC, and he's speaking to Judah, the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom has already faced the threat of the Assyrian kingdom. God has basically told uh, Israel that if they didn't get their act together, they would meet with his judgment through Assyria, and they came. And now Judah is watching what's taking place, and, and God is being saying through Isaiah, tell them to watch out, because if they don't change, the same thing's going to happen. They didn't, and so Isaiah actually prophesied that in about 100 years, Judah would, say, would face the same fate, but through the nation of Babylon, and they did, which is where we get to chapter 40. Chapter 40, written about 100 years before that captivity took place. It's as if God's inspiring Isaiah to write something that those people will read when they're in dominion, captivity under Babylon. And you know how we are. When things aren't going real well, we get depressed, we get desperate, we find ourselves in despair, and all of a sudden God becomes way smaller as we interpret God through our circumstances. And so God inspires Isaiah to write this particular chapter that once again reminds the people of the nature of God. So here's the thing. As we go through this passage, I'm going to ask you to engage your imagination. I'm just going to read it, make a, a few comments, but please engage your imagination through this passage as God, tw uh, 2,700 years later, is trying to get our attention to the reality of who and how awesome he is. Verse 12 says this, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand or marked off the heavens with the span of his hand? That's a big hand. As a matter of fact, when you take a look at what's happening in our world, as far as the oceans are concerned, we basically have one global ocean that's being divided up by land masses and continents. So we have the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Indian, Antarctic, and Arctic oceans. But it still forms one global ocean that's about 139 million square miles, occupies about 320 million cubic miles of water at an average depth, average of two miles deep. So here's what I want you to do. Y'all take your hand like this. Hold your hand like this. Look at your palm and imagine all of the oceans of the world, streams and rivers are occupied in your hand. And God measures all of that in his hand. He holds all of that. Now take that same hand and hold it out like this. Because what God does is he measures the sky. He measures the heavens, the universe with the span of his hand. You can put them down now. Here's what scientists are saying about the observable. Not the stuff that they can't see, but the observable universe. They estimate at being 93 billion light years in diameter. Can you get your mind around that? I can't. 93 billion light years in diameter, and God measures it with the span of his hand. That's a pretty big hand. That's a pretty big God. Isaiah goes on to say, Who has gathered the dust of the earth in a measure? or weighed the mountains on a balance and the hills on the scales. I've been to Grandfather Mountain. I've been to the Blue Mountains in Jamaica. I've had the privilege of being in Europe and seeing the, the Alps. And they are magnificent. They are formidable, powerful. Can you imagine, and again, that God, who he is, all that he is, is able to take the mountains and place them on a scale and weighs them. He goes on further. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or who gave him counsel? Who did he consult? Who gave him understanding and taught him the paths of justice? Who taught him knowledge? Showed him the way of understanding? In other words, who did God go to for advice? When God got stressed out, who did he go to to be able to get some counsel and get comfort? Nobody. He is the source of all wisdom and needs no help, no advice, no counsel. He is the beginning of all understanding. Verse 15. Behold, look, the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are considered as a speck of dust on the scales. He lifts up the islands like fine dust. You know when you're, when you're pouring water out of a bucket or out of a cup or out of a pitcher and almost all the water is gone except one drop, right? So see in your mind that one drop that's just kind of hanging from the lip of that pitcher or that, that cup or bucket. According to the passage, all the nations are like that drop to God as well as all of these nations that are like a speck of dust on his scales. A speck of dust on the scale that doesn't change the balance of the scales at all. That what you and I consider to be formidable, what you and I consider that which is worthy of our fear of what nations might do, 
God doesn't sweat that at all. They mean nothing to him. Lebanon's Caesars are not enough for fuel or its animals enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are considered by him as empty nothingness. The comparison and the perspective of God about the things that we think are all that ain't all that. Verse 22 says, God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like thin cloth and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Something like maybe we would do with our backyard, take like a big tarp or big blanket and pitch it as a tent or actual tent. Well, God spreads out the entire universe as a tent for him to live in and it's still not big enough because he fills all of it. Verse 23, he reduces princes to nothing and makes judges of the earth like a wasteland. They are barely planted, barely sown. Their, st their stem hardly takes root in the ground when he blows on them and they wither and a whirlwind carries them away like stubble. Folks, he's talking about that way about rulers, governments, despots, military leaders, those things that you and I are always concerned about. What are they gonna do? What's gonna happen to them? They're like dust to God. He blows on them and they're gone. Then why are we so worried? about what they will do with a God who views them that way. Verse 28, the Lord is the everlasting God. That means that he endures forever with no beginning or end. The creator of the whole earth, he never becomes faint or weary and there is no limit to his understanding. That's what God reveals of himself through the scripture about his transcendence above and beyond any limitations. What's our response to that? And our response should be, whoa, wow, amazing. And yet because of our circumstances, sometimes we are so mesmerized by our little world that God fits into that picture. So God has to ask these kinds of questions. Verse 18, with whom will you compare God? What likeness will you set up for comparison with him? Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not considered the foundations of the earth? To whom will you compare me or who is my equal? Asks the Holy One. Suppose those questions are not rhetorical. Suppose those questions really demand that we pause a minute and answer them. Because all of us, whether you've been a Christian for a long time, whether you've been a Christian for a short time, maybe you're not a believer at all. All of us have a concept of God that we compare him to our creation. So let me ask you, who do you turn to for security? Who are you turning to for significance? Who are you turning to for strength? A sense of identity, well-being, success. Your 401k? Your spouse? Your kids? Your job, the government, counselors, your vices, or maybe the number one God we all deal with, self. Who are you comparing the transcendent God to? The answer to that question determines the quality of our life. Because here's what I've discovered in my own life, the needs in Jonathan and the needs in humanity require something and someone far greater than anything in this life. I think that King David must have kind of been thinking about that in Psalm chapter eight when he says, when I consider the work of your fingers, the heavens, when I think, I look upon the heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and stars you set in place, here's what he says, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? In other words, David says, when I take a look at all that you've made and I consider all that you are, why do you even give a rip about us? Why do you even care? What is it about us that causes you to be so mindful? And here's the thing, here's the truth about it. Listen to me. This transcendent, amazing God who is beyond all the limits, he really does intimately, intentionally care for you. You matter to that kind of God everything about you. What, 
What is it about us that causes a God like that to even care? And yet, he does. How does he care for us? One of the ways that he shows us is in that other attribute, his eminence. The fact that God is always present. Let's take a look at that for a second. We just came off of the Christmas season celebrating the incarnation of God into the person of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And one of the names that Jesus would be given would be Emmanuel, which means God, what? With us. Here's the deal. From Genesis all the way through Revelation, God has always been involved with his creation. He's never just started it, kicked it going, and then stepped out and no longer had any activity with it. He's always, even to the formation of man, he was in the dirt formatting and making and creating man. And then that relationship with Adam and Eve, this intimacy that he had walking with them all the way to Revelation. God has never been a part from his creation. He's always been involved with it. And King David probably expressed that when in his Psalm 139, when he says this in verse seven, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest ocean, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I love what one person said about the riding the wings of the morning basically said that that's what happens when the sun rises and its beams emit by the speed of light, a ray of light to the western horizon. It's almost as if David says, if I was riding that way, riding that ray of light, you'd be there. This imminence of God that also reveals another aspect, and that's his omnipresence. Not considering spatial dimensions or size dimensions, the omnipresence of God is the fact that God is fully present in every point in time at the same time. God is present in every point of time, bringing his whole being while acting in different ways, in different places at the same time. If you can understand that, then please have a conversation with me because that just blows my mind. There's a particular term in music, it's called a complex counterpoint, where on the piano, you can be playing one particular melody on your right hand and another melody, completely different melody with your left hand, and they harmonize. That's just a concept that's just difficult to understand. How in the world do you do that? But this God who is omnipresent, this God who is imminent. I confess to you that at home, I enjoy playing some pranks with my wife, I may. did this with my daughter as well, too. And for some reason, they didn't appreciate the artistry in what I did. But I would enjoy the, the, the idea that sometimes I would uh, sneak around at the house. Um, we have a, uh, you know, a, a split level where we've got an upstairs, and I like being able to come down so that the stairs don't creak and then just show up where my, wherever my wife is. Like she'll be cooking at the, at the stove, and I'll, I'll just come down, and I'll just stand right. I don't go, boo, I just, I just stay there. So when she turns around, she freaks out. I love that. She freaks out, and she gets a heart attack, and I'm like, hey, you know you're alive. There you go, you're welcome. Or one particular time, it didn't work out real well for me. I came down the stairs. She was watching TV on the couch. I came downstairs, and I just, I, I love one person in the other service says, I'm stalking my wife. Yeah, sort of. So I came up behind the couch, and I bent down to kiss her, and she reacted, and I got punched in the face. And she offered no apology to that. Sneaking around, I like that. That's not how God does it. God doesn't figure out where you're going to go and then moves ahead. Here's the thing. God is where you are and where you will be at the same time. What? Where you are and where you are and where you are and where you are and you are and you are and, you are and where you'll be at the same time. Here's what's even more powerful about that is that wherever he is, his full being is there as well. All, all that God is, wherever he is, fully present and fully active. It'll take one step further as we reveal, as John reveals in his gospel about Jesus Christ where we deal with the transcendence in John chapter one, verse one, it says this, in the beginning was the word, that's the transcendent God, and the word was with God, and the word was God, he was with God in the beginning. 
all things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was a light of men. That's transcendence. Here comes the imminence. Verse 14. The word, the transcendent God, became flesh and dwelt among us. Eugene Peterson's the message basically said that God became one of us and moved into the neighborhood. He became one of us and came to be with us. And we, this is what John says, we observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. For the Greek philosopher back then, they believed that the ideal was what's eternal and what's invisible. For the Jewish law keepers, they believed that it was impossible for a human being to become God, but they never considered the possibility that God could become human. We see in verse 18, I'm going to read this carefully because in different versions this can be confusing. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. That the fullness of who God is is present in the God-man, Jesus Christ. Later on, John will have a lot of excitement as he says, this particular manifestation, the revelation of God, which we have seen with our eyes, we've heard with our ears, we've touched with our hands, we proclaim to you as well. So here's the significance of the transcendence and the imminence for where you and I live right now. Number one, God is fully present where you are. God is fully present right where you are. This one in whom we live and move and have our being, who desires us to seek him, desires us for us to reach out and find a God who wants to be found and wants to be known, and he is near, right where you are, fully present. But number two, and this is awesome, this God who is fully present, all that God is, is also fully active. Right where you are. Fully active, right where you are. We see this in the person in the ministry of Jesus Christ all the miracles that Jesus performed, he was expressing the transcendence, the power, the limitless nature of God in the lives of people, whether he would heal them from blindness or liberate them from demonic possession or raise the dead, his power of God available, active, right where people were. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 says this, that he, the everlasting God, gives strength to the faint Strengthens the powerless. Youths may become faint and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not become faint. So let me ask you, where do you need the strength of God in your life right now? Where do you need the power of this transcendent, infinite, everlasting God in your world, right where you are. In your marriage, in your relationships, in your job, in your health, in your mental well-being. Because he is fully active and fully present as he is all of that all that he is right where you are. Listen to me. I, in my personal struggles, I, I don't understand why God operates in certain ways the way that he does and doesn't do it the exact same way that I want him to. As a matter of fact, I, I really would, I wanted God to be able to ask my opinion about how he should do things. He doesn't seem to ask my opinion. How is it that he, that he blesses in a particular way and yet with expectations doesn't do it the same way? I don't understand how God operates. But here's what I've come to learn to be true in my years of pursuing Christ, imperfectly. Here's what I've come to learn to be true. That in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Sometimes he works in ways I don't even deserve. But God is always working is good right where you are. 
this past year difficult for everybody? As a matter of fact, how many of you would say that you experienced some difficulty this past year? Hands up in the air. Experienced some difficulty. Exactly right. Now let me ask you this. <laughs> let me ask you this. How many of you, in spite of the difficulty, you would still say, yes, as bad as it has been, I have experienced the goodness or a blessing in some way. I've experienced a blessing and the privilege of knowing God this particular year. How many, put them up. Take a look around as the hands are up. Take a look around. People, this is a testimony of the fact that even though I don't see it, what? He's working. Even though I can't feel it, what? He's work he never stops. He never stops working. And so here's the, the challenge for us as we move into this. With all that we mentioned, and, and folks, I just scratched the surface today, right? Just scratched the surface. But is that not the kind of God that's worth getting to know? And listen, again, this may be your first time to church ever. This may be your first excursion into Jesus and faith. You may be here as a Christian for a very long time. I'm just saying, is this not the kind of God that we should say, you know something? I need to readjust my life to get to know him better. So here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Grow in your knowledge and understanding of God. Start here, right? Start here. And Forest Hill wants to help. As a matter of fact, if you want to scan the QR code either on the screen or at the seat back that's ahead of you, we want to be able to connect you to ways that you can learn more about who God is. We've got a starting point class where people who've got questions can get to a safe place where they can ask questions about God. So I invite you to become a part of the starting point. Or as we launch bridge groups or these opportunities for people to know who God is, you scan the QR code. We want to come alongside of you and help you. But here are some really simple, practical things that you can do just to start that journey. One of my favorite passages of scripture, which I want to commend for your memories, from your memory, comes from Psalm 119, verse 18. Here's what it says. Open my eyes that I may see the wonderful things in your law. Basically, we're saying, God, if you don't open my eyes, I'm not going to see it. So God, I come before you humbly. Open my eyes that I may see the wonderful things in your law, the wonderful things about you. Memorize that scripture and recite it daily. Open my eyes that I can see. So the prayer is basically like this. God, I want to know you. God, I want to know you. Please help me. Please, please help me. He loves those kinds of prayers. And if you pray that prayer, I'd say this. Get ready. Be alert for God to reveal himself in a way that may transcend your expectations. As a matter of fact, I pray that this year, 2021, may be the year that you and I experience a revelation of God's nature in ways that we have never known. Are you with me on it? Beginning right now, over the next several weeks, next several months, that we are going to experience by our seeking him that God will express himself in ways we've never known. Amen? Let's get after it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, first, forgive us for the ways that we have lived short-sighted for who you are. And we pray that by your grace that's infinite, your love that is infinite, your mercy that is infinite, that Jesus, you would do the work in our life to open our hearts, open our minds, open our eyes to who you are and reveal yourself and adjust our life to that self-disclosure. Do that work, we pray, to draw us into the depth of intimacy and affection with a God who really cares for us right where we are. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and let's respond and worship together.